afternoon. National Assembly for Wales is now in session. And the first item this afternoon are questions to the First Minister. And question one, Clear Griffith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on the implications of the Williams Commission recommendations on public services in North Wales? The Commission published its report on the 20th of January, and may I put on record my thanks to the Commission for the work that they've undertaken. We all now want to consider their findings in detail. Thank you very much for that response. You said in an interview with the BBC yesterday in regard to the reorganization of local government, and I quote that, if you want to do this relatively quickly, you will have to retain the same number of councillors and in future say, well, this is the time for a reduction in numbers. Can you therefore confirm that it is the Welsh Government's intention to reduce the number of councillors in the longer term? Yes, of course. It would be sensible to say that if there were fewer councils, there should be fewer councillors. But may I say that I now wish to meet with other leaders in order to discuss the views of the various parties within the Assembly in order to progress with this as soon as possible. Mark Ishwood. Uh, thanks. Uh, you may be aware that the Communities Equality Local Government Committee recently completed an inquiry into progress with local government collaboration. How do you respond to the evidence to that inquiry from Conwy Council on behalf of North Wales councils that working across organisational and geographic boundaries could bring complexity and ambiguity that could generate confusion uh, and weaken accountability? Uh, parallel by Carly Business School, who said you have hundreds of different cost curves all behaving differently. There's no simple answer to the local government size conundrum. Well, I mean, the member makes the case for reorganisation, doesn't he? Uh, by saying that uh, the, 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 the evidence is not there that there is working across boundaries or that it's, it's too complicated. What the Williams Commission identifies is a need for change now. It identifies the need for change in order to benefit the public. It also identifies the problems that have arisen due to a lack of collaboration that is uh, not taking place uh, between many local authorities in Wales. And Robert. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I'm sure that most of the population will be more concerned about the quality of services rather than boundaries, and some of the recommendations will create a situation where certain responsibilities, such as housing, where one council, where one council has um, outsourced the housing stock and the other has retained its housing stock, is the timetable in terms of having some sort of progress by Easter a reasonable one, given all of these implications? No, by Easter, I'd like to be in a position where every political party in this assembly will have a definite opinion. The process won't be over by Easter, of course. The next step, of course, will be to consider in which way the change should happen, because following uh, there will follow a practical process in the assembly. It won't be possible to introduce a uh, bill here in the assembly before the assembly elections but if there is consensus to move uh, an inter-party consensus to move things forward more quickly than that then we can do that but there are practical practicalities we have to consider what we're talking about is a system that will improve services for the people of wales before we move to question two i'm sure members would like to join me in welcoming a delegation from our sister parliament in canada and hope they'll find this afternoon beneficial um, question two, David Rees. Clarice, what discussions have the First Minister had with UK Government Ministers on energy pricing? We've consistently raised with UK Government Ministers our concerns. I've personally raised uh, concerns with Vince Cable, explaining to him the concerns that are passed on to me by our energy intensive industries that the cost of energy for them is too high. And we do, of course, remain concerned about the ability of the UK to remain competitive with energy costs as they are. Well, thank you for that answer, First Minister. And as you may be aware, last week the foundation industries, which include anchor companies such as Tata Steel, actually did write to the UK government asking for them to ensure that they, had, they created a level playing field for them to operate within, and that included energy costs. So that the companies can compete, as you say, effectively and efficiently in a, in a global market. Uh, the companies bring huge investment into Wales and the, uh, support our economy dramatically and employ many people. Do you agree with me that this UK government has actually failed those companies and their employees by failing to tackle the energy costs? And will you raise with the Prime Minister next time we meet him those issues and so he can change his approach to funding and costing of energy prices? 
Well, I, I thank the member for his comments. I have raised the issue, as I said, with Vince Cable. I have, if I remember as well, raised the issue with JMC. Uh, it is an issue that is of uh, crucial importance to those industries that are important to the Welsh economy, but are, are high energy users, despite the fact, like Tata, they've taken uh, steps and have invested heavily in reducing the amount of energy that they use. The nature of the business is such that they're bound to use a substantial amount of energy, and I would urge the UK government to address this position as quickly as possible in order to secure the future of our manufacturing industries. Russell George. Uh, one of the ways to mitigate higher energy prices in the future is to improve uh, the energy performance of new uh, and existing buildings, both domestic and non-domestic. Why has the government uh, significantly reduced its building regulation targets for greenhouse gas emissions, which could, of course, go a long way to lowering energy prices? That's been done in order to assist the construction industry, because I, I thought you might welcome that, actually in order to, uh, to help the construction industry to uh, improve its performance over the next few years. The Minister made it absolutely clear that he wanted to make sure that targets were reached within a reasonable time, but that they were not introduced so quickly as to stymie the recovery of the construction industry, which employs so many people in Wales. Alan Fred-Jones. Uh, Thank you very much. Problems related to high electricity prices have been a concern for Tata Steel and other industries over many years. Would having a government-owned company, possibly owned by the Welsh Government, to distribute electricity enable a better deal for taxpayers and for businesses? Well, first of all, a question arises regarding European regulations. It wouldn't be possible to subsidise any company we would have to find some means of funding the company which uh, goes against state aid. And of course, it wouldn't be possible to establish any company that would work in any way that wasn't competitive. Because if you want a competitive market, then it's important that all companies are competing on a fair basis. But of course, the other question, that's another matter. You would have to have the company to uh, build their own and not work in a way which is contrary to European regulations. Questions to the party leaders. And first this afternoon, we have the Leader of the Opposition, Andrew Archie Davis. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. First Minister, uh, you said recently that you were confident that the Welsh Ambulance Service or Welsh NHS Trust has the resources it needs. You are aware of the tragic incident of the death of Mr Pring from Flintshire in the news last week, who died after waiting 42 minutes for an ambulance to arrive. The reason, because there were no ambulances available to attend. We were told that the situation was that there were six vehicles waiting at Wrexham Myler Hospital and three at Aspetti Glanclwyd. The inquest also concluded that if an ambulance had been available, then the, the optimised prospects for his survival would have been greatly increased. Now, when you hear of these type of events, do you believe that the Welsh Ambulance Service has the resources it requires to actually stop events like this happening? First of all, could I express my uh, condolences to the family of uh, Mr Pring and uh, what happened to him? It is right to say that the coroner did not say that Mr Pring would have lived had the ambulance arrived. It is right to say he would have had a better chance of, um, of living uh, had the ambulance arrived in time. That much is, is true. That said, of course, this was uh, not a typical event uh, in the history of the, uh, the Welsh Ambulance uh, uh, Trust, nor is it typical of their performance over the course of the last year. But nevertheless, it is important they continue to uh, improve as they have done in order to minimise events such as this occurring in the future. First Minister, I asked you, did the ambulance service have the resources that it requires to try and stop events like this happening? You will be aware that your own District General Hospital last Thursday at the Princess of Wales Hospital had, I'm told, 11 ambulances waiting outside it, and of which, in the news last night, a similar type of event to this, where a patient was unable to be discharged into the care of the hospital, and that delay potentially could have affected the outcome of the patient's uh, 
ability to survive the incident that they were presenting for at the hospital. I ask you again, First Minister, given that I've cited two examples in very recent weeks, does the Welsh Ambulance Service have the resources to help mitigate and stop these type of events happening at our district general hospitals? The answer to that is yes. But could I just point the Leader of the Opposition uh, to one aspect that does affect certainly uh, ambulance <laughs> response times, and that of course is the time it takes to get through A&E. Uh, part of the problem, if not much of the problem, is that A&E can become overloaded from time to time and that's what delays the ambulances. And so the answer is to get more people through A&E in order to release ambulances more quickly. That of course is why, as a government, we are so keen to ensure that we have a structure for the NHS that enables that to happen. It's not a question of ambulance resources, it's a question of ensuring that the hospitals are able to admit patients as quickly as possible. And that's why, of course, there have been proposals across Wales uh, to uh, look again at the structure of A&E. I think we're, that is where we will disagree, because I do not believe by shutting A&E departments you actually will increase the life chances of people who are presenting at the ones that are to remain. Uh, obviously, one of the key problems about people progressing through A&E is to be taken into the hospital environment, and the lock, lack of beds and the loss of beds is one of the big obstacles for people to be able to pass through A&E, and then ambulances when they bring new patients to discharge into A&E. We have the worst A&E waiting times in the United Kingdom, regrettably. <laughs> what key actions are you going to be undertaking to see that there is improvement, and I would suggest immediate improvement, in our A&E times, so that the events that I've outlined previously at Wrexham Myler and at your own District General Hospital can cease to be an occurrence within the Welsh NHS and patients and families will not go through the trauma that those individuals' families have gone through recently. Well, I disagree with him when he says we have the worst uh, A&E times. If he looks, for example, at Belfast, he will see that there have been enormous problems there, particularly around the Royal Victoria Hospital, where a state of emergency was effectively declared at, uh, at, one, at one point. But he makes the point, what can we do to uh, increase the throughput of patients through A&E? He will know but the extra resource that we have uh, put into the NHS, £570 million, which will assist in that. But there's no getting away from the fact that people also need to go to the right A&E in terms of the condition that they have. And that means making sure that people go there to the right A&E in the first place, making sure that the A&E departments are able to deal with them in terms of the experience that they have, which is why reorganisation, of course, is something that is being taken forward across Wales. But also, of course, there is a responsibility here as well on individuals. It's still the case, I believe, that people go to A&E when they don't need to. Uh, and where people do that, and speaking to A&E consultants in my own hospital in Bridgend, it accounts for between a third and a half of the cases that they see. People shouldn't be there in the first place because they have been to see a GP. The GP has said there's nothing wrong with you, so they go to A&E because the GP said that to them. Now, there is a, a, a level of discipline, I think, that people need to exert as well. I see nothing wrong in local health boards saying to people, look, don't come to A&E unless you really have to. I think that's perfectly sensible advice. But on top of that as well, in order to minimise the uh, tragic occurrences that have occurred uh, twice in the past uh, year, it is important that the resource is there, and I'd argue that's exactly what we've done. We now move to Leader of Plaid Cymru, Leanne Wood. First Minister, the Williams Commission report has helped to shine a very concerning light on public services in this country. The Commission confirmed that public service performance in places is poor and patchy, uh, is too complex and lacking in ambition. Do you accept this verdict of your leadership? Well, it doesn't talk about the government, does it? I mean, it does a little about the government, but it's good concern mainly. It's concerned mainly with local government and other public services. The reality is, if you look at the report, it talks about uh, situations where some public service bodies see regulation and inspection as a burden or something to be resisted. The reality is, this is all about ser servicing the public, and the reality is. But the present structure of local government, which is part of that report, will never be able to deliver the level of service that people expect. First Minister, you are in charge of public services in Wales, and what has been said about local government can equally be applied to our National Health Service. 
There are very real people being affected by poor public services. We've just heard about the heart-wrenching case of a patient from Flincher who lay for 40 minutes waiting for an ambulance while his wife watched him die. Surely you would agree, First Minister, that this is something that should never, ever happen in our country. Indeed so. I agree with that. But in relation to uh, the Williams Commission, I, I would remind the Leader of Plaid Cymru that her party did not come forward with the idea for a commission such as this, did not consider there was a need to look very carefully about the way in which the structure of public services were delivered in Wales. And, and I do await now with, you know, with an open mind what her view will be on the Williams Commission. I reiterate the point I made earlier on, and that is... There needs to be change in Wales, there needs to be reorganisation of local government in Wales. We can take forward the Williams Commission's report. Now, in order for that to happen, there needs to be a level of cross-party support within this chamber. I want to talk to the other party leaders in order to establish how much of that is possible. This is a major change to local government. I, I would like to see this done on a basis that is as cross-party as possible. I extend that invitation to her. Yeah. Well, thank you, First Minister, and I am interested in um, reaching a consensus with you, but I, I would contend that you were not starting the process in the, uh, the correct manner. This very morning, I'm going back to public services, this very morning, Betsy Cadwallader Health Board have postponed all uh, non-elective surgery, and this is the second health board to do this. There is clearly a capacity issue which you have failed to get to grips with. Now, rather than centralise and cut health services further, which will put further pressures on ambulances and on A&E departments, why don't you now back Plaid Cymru's proposals to boost doctor recruitment? If you're against this, First Minister, can you tell us exactly what are you for? Uh, well, I would be in a better position, I'm sure, to support Plaid Cymru if the doctors themselves supported you, and they don't. If you look at what doctors are saying about the NHS in Wales, the vast majority of them will say there needs to be change, and yet you just keep on opposing change all the time. They will say to you, doctors will say to you, that the difficulty is throughput of patients. You cannot create a situation where there are more patients coming through a hospital. It doesn't happen unless you, unless you have a service that is more centralised. You cannot go against, unless you're prepared to ignore the Royal College of Surgeons and to ignore the advice of independent doctors, which is what your party is constantly trying to do, then you cannot create a Shangri-La situation that you want. We want a sustainable health service that is based on the guidance that doctors themselves give. You want to ignore that guidance. Where doctors say a service is unsafe, you want to ignore that and, and pretend that it isn't happening. That is not sustainable. Coming back to the, the question that she, she asked about the Williams Commission, I now look forward to working with Plaid Cymru and other parties with a view to getting a consensus on the way the public services are delivered in Wales in order to improve them for the people of Wales. And finally, the leader of the Welsh Liberal Democrats, Kirsty Williams. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, in your programme for government, which you are very fond of referring to in this chamber, uh, you list a whole series of targets that you will use to measure NHS performance. On Sunday, you said it's difficult to see what the justification is for them and that there was no logic for them. If there is no logic to them, what on earth were you doing, including them, in your programme for government less than three years ago? Because they exist. If you look at the uh, clinical reasoning for the targets, it's difficult to see where that reasoning comes from, that much is true. Now, that's not coming from us, that's coming from doctors. When I went around Wales hospitals together with the health minister in the summer, they said the same thing to us. They said, look, if you have targets with regard to A&E, we have people who come here they may spend 13 hours in A&E, but the alternative is that they spend three days in hospital. So we keep them in for longer, and the targets don't help. Now, clearly, we need to revisit the targets, but I'm fully aware of the fact that revisiting the targets without actually reaching at least some of them will leave us over the allegation that we're trying to, uh, to stitch the, uh, the, the figures up. I understand that. And so what I said on Sunday was I'd like to see us reach some of those targets and then consider carefully, having reached those targets, whether in fact they need to be changed. Well, let's look at one specific target. You promised in your programme of government that you would improve access and patient experience by ensuring rapid investigations and treatment. Uh, 
Are weights for scans, endoscopies, no longer important? Or is it the fact that the number of people waiting longer than eight weeks for diagnostic services has trebled in the two last two years? Is that one that you're planning to meet or one that you're planning to ditch? It's true to say that there have been challenges, as I've said many times in this chamber over the past year or two. We're confident, however, that the extra resources, the £570 million, going into the NHS will help to meet some of those challenges. But, First Minister, it's not just that target, is it? Uh, you don't routinely meet your government's ambulance response time targets. You don't meet your cancer targets. You don't meet your A&E targets. And the number of people waiting more than nine months for treatment, well, that's hit a new, town, new time high. If you're saying that those things aren't important anymore in our NHS, how are you going to measure your government's performance in running the health service? And I ask you again, which ones of those are you planning to meet and which ones are you planning to ditch? We plan to meet them all. I'm not pretending it's easy to do that. This is not a situation that's unique to Wales. England routinely misses its targets as well. The reality is, for example, when it comes to cancer, uh, cancer waiting times, cancer treating treatment times, the situation is the same in Wales as it is in England. The reality is the vast majority of people have prompt and effective <coughs> medical care. That is not to say, of course, there cannot be improvement. It was the leader of the Liberal Democrats who suggested that we didn't think that these figures are important. Of course they're important. The performance of the NHS is important to all of us in this chamber. That is why, of course, the Health Minister has outlined very carefully how he intends to see the health service improve in terms of the resources he has put in. But I do emphasise that there cannot be improvement in the health service without structural change. One cannot run without the other. And for those parties, and her party is not one of them in fairness, but for those parties who oppose all or any change in the NHS, despite on occasions independent panels of doctors saying there has to be change, I have to say to them, the NHS will not improve as long as those parties hold those positions. You never said that. No, you haven't. <laughs> Question three, Dara Miller. Will minister make a statement on his priorities for the Welsh NHS in 2014? A topical question. Uh, we continue to improve the quality, safety and sustainability of the NHS. Thank you for that answer, uh, Minister. Do you uh, agree with me that there is a developing crisis which is deepening in the Welsh uh, NHS, particularly around our emergency and unscheduled care? On the 10th of December, people were told not to attend Morriston's A&E department because, unless they had a genuine emergency. With Bush, they were told that they shouldn't attend that hospital unless there was absolutely uh, necessary. Morriston and Princess of Wales, 6th of January, had to cancel operations because of pressures on beds. Uh, we know that Wrexham Myler was described as being log jammed on the 8th uh, of January and of course we've heard just today about the cancellation of operations in North Wales. Your health minister said that there isn't a crisis in the Welsh uh, NHS but would you agree with me that your record breaking NHS budget cuts are not helping the situation, that you're cutting the NHS budget too far, too fast to coin a phrase and is it now a matter of regret for you? that you do not have a national comprehensive winter NHS plan, unlike the UK government, and what action are you taking to sort this problem out once and for all? Yeah. Well, f first of all, he talks about a winter plan. There is a winter plan, and it's working. No, it's not. If you look at A&E figures not, in England, they're worse Darren than Miller? ever. They're worse than ever. Look at the, the papers on the 11th of January. Things are getting far worse Darren than his party stewardship, if you can use that word, in, uh, in, in London. The, the reality is, he stands up in this chamber and he says that where advice is given to people that they should not attend A&E unless it's an emergency, that advice is wrong. You know, he seems to be suggesting that according to the Conservatives, A&E departments are extended GP surgeries. I stand by that advice. People shouldn't be going to A&E unless they're a genuine emergency. He is saying Darren Miller, go to will you let the First Minister answer? I'm sorry, First Minister, I can't hear what you're saying because Darren Miller keeps repeating things. I, I can't hear him either, but there it well. is, uh, presiding officer. The reality is that it's quite right that people shouldn't attend A&E unless they're a genuine emergency. He might think it's an extended GP surgery. It is not. We've put extra resources into the NHS. This compares with his party that has cut the NHS by £20 billion pounds in England. £20 billion pounds in England. Except, except... They call those cuts efficiencies. 
because if you call them efficiencies, they're not really cuts, are they? That's the reality of Conservative rule. We see A&E departments struggling in England. In Wales, we, have a, we approach this with honesty. We understand the challenges. We have put more resources in, and we have an NHS that properly benefits the people of Wales, not one that is being hammered by billions of pounds of the cuts by the Conservatives in London. Helen Jones. First Minister, one of the reasons that ambulances queue outside A&E is very often there's a lack of beds on the wards, and that's very often because beds are blocked as there's a lack of provision in the community. With the exception of POIS, yesterday, because uh, the Williams Commission didn't recommend the amalgamation of social services and health services there, in my view, how are you in 2014 going to direct health boards and local authorities to amalgamate uh, budgets and services much better than they're doing at present? That's a very strong message. It's extremely important that they work as closely together as possible. And if we're talking about social services, we are, of course, talking about care services. We're not talking about adoption, for example. I understand that. But no, the message has been conveyed to the local health boards and, of course, to the local councils that it's extremely important that they do collaborate in order to ensure that the citizen is given the best service possible. William Powell. First Minister, last uh, term I raised with you the urgent fire safety um, requirements that had to be put in place at uh, uh, Bronteley's Hospital's Pain Management Centre. And I'm pleased to say since uh, your uh, intervention at the, uh, towards the end of the autumn, that work has actually now been put in hand. But my uh, question for you today is, particularly in the context of uh, your Health Minister's statement last week with regard to the NHS uh, concentrating more on the areas where it can deliver good rather than potentially delivering uh, harm, uh, would it not be prudent to consider investing further in that uh, recognised centre of excellence, particularly as it would, on a spent-to-save basis, potentially um, <coughs> reduce the burden of cost for um, expensive and ever-escalating -esc uh, drug bills for pain relief? Well, I, I, these are matters, of course, for the local health board. I'm sure they will want to invest in such a way that services are delivered better uh, and that uh, services aren't delivered efficiently. Of course, uh, they'd all want to, to do that. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, uh, following your question in the, uh, in the Assembly Chamber, that work seems to be uh, beginning, at least at Bronteley's. Question four, Susie Davis. Bill Clewith, uh, First Minister, Cook and Arkwright reported last week that many small businesses in Wales are paying double the business rate that they should be paying. Uh, Oh, I'm so sorry, of course. It's my mistake. What actions will the Welsh Government be taking to support the Welsh High Street in 2014? It's very sporting of the member to give me a supplementary before the uh, main question. But, uh, I'm sure not the first. Could I say that our vibrant and viable places framework demonstrates a clear emphasis on the regeneration of town centres in Wales. This will be supported by further action, including business improvement district support, a town centre loan fund, action on business rates. Members will be aware, of course, of the cap and a high street support campaign launched this autumn. Thank you, First Minister, and at the risk of repeating myself, um, can you, uh, I mean, I welcome the 2% the cap in the business rates that uh, you mentioned just now, but your own high street strategy is now some seven months late. Um, how about adopting some of the Welsh Conservative policies that were announced in the uh, vision for a high street in the, in the meantime? Well, I think there is there's some uh, common ground here. We all want to see the high streets uh, thrive. Uh, that's why, of course, we announced the pilot town centres loan scheme. Uh, that's being brought forward to assist local partners in pilot areas to bring their own town centres back to, to life. Uh, officials are also working with a small task and finish group regarding a campaign, as I've mentioned, in support of our high streets, which will launch this uh, autumn. And, of course, the Minister announced business rate relief schemes which will benefit town centres by encouraging construction and speculative developments and supporting long-term empty premises back into use. And, of course, uh, the business rates cap will help that. Roger Glyn Thomas. First Minister, I'm pleased that you acknowledge that there is a crisis facing very many of the high streets in 
Wales at present. And one of the things that impacts upon the image of the High Street is empty shops. Would you consider working with local authorities to see how these can be filled, possibly with businesses that can't afford to have uh, large premises at or prominent premises at uh, present. And the second thing is parking. Do you believe that you could be creative with parking, offering perhaps an hour or two hours during the day for free? Well, that's something for local authorities in Wales. And in terms of pop-up businesses, if I can describe them in that way, then I think it's possible for local authorities to work with businesses to consider whether it would be possible, for example, to secure a month for a business without having to pay rates, without having to pay rent, just to see if they can be sustainable. And then if they are sustainable, they would then have to pay those costs. It would give the opportunity to some people who perhaps don't want to start a business and be tied in to some sort of contracts, just to see if there is a market there for them in terms of what they are endeavoring to sell. One of the problems that we have to consider, and I was thinking of this this morning, is in my opinion, the house street has to rethink the way it works because of the fact that most high street customers are at work when those shops are open. They close at 5.30, well, for most people and for most of us in this chamber, there is very little shopping happening during the working week. So people do tend to go to shops that are open later. So we also have to consider the opening hours of our high street stores in order to draw people in during the evenings and not only during the daytime. Question five, Lindsay Whittle. Uh, sorry. Um, First Minister, uh, what evidence do you have that the Welsh Government's approach to reducing smoking in cars carrying children is having any positive impact, please? Well, recent research has shown an increase in people reporting that smoking uh, was not allowed in their main car. We have also commissioned studies of primary and secondary school age children's exposure to second-hand smoke in cars. Uh, the results of that uh, research will be available later this year. Could I thank you, uh, First Minister, for uh, answering my question. Uh, it's well known that 80% of the public want smoking in cars carrying children to be banned, yet 22% of adults still smoke when children are in their car. Eminent medics tell us that this form of passive smoking leads to asthma, chest infections, ear problems, and even cot deaths. Whilst we have been waiting for the past two years, children have been suffering. Uh, I know that some Conservatives have opposed this with shouts about personal freedom. Isn't it time, uh, time, First Minister, to put children's rights to good health above so-called personal freedoms and ban smoking in cars in which children are passengers? That option, of course, is available to us uh, when that research uh, becomes available in the summer. We have always said uh, that if the voluntary approach does not work, we will then look to legislate. William Graham. Officer. The first minister will be aware that every year in Wales around 14 and a half young people, 11 and 15, are introduced to smoking, very often through peer pressure. Uh, minister, when do you think you could, you've given one answer already, but don't you think you should look at this once again? I appreciate you want to see the evidence, but the, most people would like this ban to be in place. Could you uh, consider, reconsider rather, bringing legislation forward to outlaw smoking in cars with children? Well, I think we need to uh, get the results of the research to provide the evidence base. Um, we all know, of course, uh, anecdotally what the situation is, but I think that, that much is important. Uh, the, the point I would make is, is this. Yes, of course, people, adults, that is, uh, have uh, a freedom to do as they wish in their own cars, but when there are children in the car, the children can't get out of the car, they can't make their own decisions. That personal freedom of adults to impose their smoking on children uh, is not something that I would look to support as uh, being in any way a freedom that does not impinge on the rights of others. And that's exactly what smoking in cars with children in does. Question six, Simon Thomas. Thank you, Presiding Officer. What plans does the First Minister have to re-establish colorectal surgery services at Bronglice Hospital? Well, I know that the board attempted to do this and somebody was offered the post in June of last year, but they just declined the post. Uh, since then, unfortunately, the Royal College has said 
that they would not support having a specialist consultant there at present because they don't believe that the model at the hospital is adequate as regards national standards. Thank you, First Minister. Those are the reasons why such treatment isn't available now in Bronglice, but there's no answer to the question as to when we will have such service available. Or are you expecting the current situation, which was to be temporary nine months ago, to continue over the next year? That's unfortunately the story we'll hand with Howell there. Temporary measures are introduced and then they become permanent. There were 300 people attending a public meeting 10 days ago in Aberystwyth and they voted unanimously and this included three assembly members from this place to re-establish this treatment. When will we see the treatment re-established in Bronglice Hospital, please? Well, at present, the college says that there aren't sufficient number of patients to uh, secure the service. Um, as I understand it, as regards cancer, they uh, only two to three people a month are impact with Bronglice. There were doctors available to do the uh, to undertake the treatment, but they couldn't undertake the laparoscopy because they couldn't train others. Once they had left, there was nobody left. So there was a problem because of the fact, uh, because of the way in which they undertook surgery at Bronglice didn't m match with the most modern ways of of doing things. Uh, there was nothing wrong with the way they were doing it, but it wasn't the practice of uh, in other hos hospitals in Wales. And so the young doctors there couldn't be trained to undertake the surgery. Now then, if the college ch changes its mind, uh, looking at the or changes their standards, but nobody can appoint a doctor in a hospital where the doctors themselves say that it's not uh, safe to do that, and that's the problem at present. Um, <coughs> Rebecca Evans. Thank you, President Officer. As uh, Simon Thomas has said, the recent meeting in Aberystwyth focused very much on colorectal surgery, and of the 300 people who were at the meeting, none were from the Health Board. Do you join me in encouraging the Health Board to up its game in terms of engaging with and listening to people across Howell Vale? I think it's essential that all health boards uh, are as accessible as possible to the people that they, they serve, and I'd urge uh, all health boards to, to, to do that. I, I would say that the health board, I understand, has said to uh, those who organised the meeting, they're more than happy to answer any written questions that are sent to them as a result of that meeting. I understand no such questions have yet been sent them. Darren Miller. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, first Minister, I too share the concerns which have been expressed by members, both about the lack of engagement by the Health Board and the challenges that this decision presents uh, to patients. One of those challenges is, of course, the transport costs to get to the other alternative centres for their uh, treatment. And I wonder what engagement the Welsh Government has had with the Health Board to ensure that it is supporting patients who need support uh, to, with finances towards those transport costs to make sure they can access the treatment that they need. I would expect the local health board, of course, to be able to assist people where it, where it can. Uh, but, but the reality, of course, of the, uh, the situation is that where you have the Royal Colleges saying that the establishment of a, of a particular service would not be safe, no politician, surely, rationally, would then try and establish that service. It's unfortunate. It has nothing to do with money. A lot of it is to do with the throughput of patients, which you cannot increase physically the number of patients going through a particular department unless you centralise the service uh, in, in, in that regard. So it's been an unfortunate scenario that's unfolded in, uh, in Bronglice. But I do mention, I do again reiterate the fact that the number of patients affected is small. I mean, for those affected, of course, it's, it, it is an issue, I understand that. But we're talking about two to three patients a month. Question seven, Reena Bjorwath. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister make a statement on the New Work Connections Initiative? Supported by £9 million from the European Social Fund, the £17 million New Work Connections project is helping disadvantaged people in North West Wales to find employment and access to training opportunities. Thank you very much. New Work Connections will be coming to an end at the end of February. It's been extremely important in assisting disadvantaged people to find a pathway back to work or a route back to work, but we still don't know what will replace it. 
Does the First Minister accept that that gap between new work connections and whatever replaces it could be detrimental from the point of view of finding employment for the most disadvantaged people? And will you make a commitment to announce plans for a new scheme as soon as possible? Well, I understand that the local authorities themselves are looking at proposals to ensure that individuals can continue with the project and they are looking to see how they can put other resources in place out with this program. Having said that, of course, we do want to ensure that the plans for the European funds for 2014-2020 have been considered and permitted by the European Commission by May of this year. Antoinette Sandbach. Presiding officer. First Minister, of, of course, you'll be aware of the Working Links programme that runs concurrently with the New Work Connections programme. So when this programme ends, it is possible for people that um, have been on the uh, new uh, Work Connections Initiative to go and seek assistance and help from Working Links. Have you been working with the UK government to see how they might be able to assist in that regard? Uh, because, of course, the Working Links programme has the same objectives of getting people back into work and to providing uh, training for them and support, particularly where they f may have particular needs or problems that need to be addressed. Yeah. Yes, the Minister has been active uh, in terms of working with the UK Government on this, and I understand there's been a recent meeting uh, with a view to uh, looking to resolve the situation. Question 8, Nick Ramsey. Will the First Minister provide an update on the progress of Enterprise Zones? Well, a progress update was published in the autumn term. Uh, we've also published performance indicators and targets against which we will report further progress in May of this year and on an annual basis thereafter. Uh, thank you, First Minister. I'm sure you're aware of the Finance Committee's report into Enterprise Zones, which was published in December uh, of last year, which alluded to what I can only describe as an air of mystery uh, surrounding where we are at the moment uh, with Enterprise Zones in Wales. Uh, one of the concerns of the report it is that it is difficult to be 100% clear, and I quote, about the influence of the strategic objectives of the Enterprise Zones, because the Welsh Government has hitherto failed to make uh, those um, objectives public, despite having them uh, in the Welsh Government uh, files, uh, so to speak. Uh, will you agree with the Finance Committee, First Minister, that recommendation one of that report should be fulfilled and that all non-commercially sensitive information relating to the objectives of the zones should now be published so that scrutiny can run its course? Well, I mean... <sighs> There's no mystery surrounding the success of our enterprise zones. We've already assisted over 60 new and growing SMEs with their business rate. That's, that's nearly four and a half million pounds committed in support. 2,000 jobs are being created across the enterprise zones. This does contrast, I have to say, with his party's stewardship of enterprise zones in England, where the target was 54,000 jobs by 2015. It seems now that 11%, 11 will be delivered of those 54,000 jobs. The National Audit Office has hammered hammered the UK government uh, recently over their stewardship of enterprise uh, zones. Now, in order to help keep track of progress, uh, members will be aware uh, that over the, ne the next year we will be uh, publishing performance indicators and targets for 2014 to 15. We look forward to publishing the first report against those indicators in the spring of this year, and we are more than happy to be scrutinised on the success of the Welsh enterprise zones compared to the abject failure of those across the border. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As one who has the privilege of representing the Snowdonia Enterprise Zone, I see no mystery at all surrounding these proposals, and I warmly welcome the developments that are taking place. But would the First Minister agree with me following the publication of the excellent report by Sir Paul Williams and his fellow commissioners that it is now crucial that local government, including planning authorities and national parks, should see their way clear to cooperate with the Welsh Government's objectives when important issues on consents for development come before them? I think I think that it's exceptionally important that that actually happens. 
With some of the major applications, they fall under a number of local authorities at times, and I know from experience that it's not easy to get them to collaborate in order to give a response to any developer. Also, of course, experience demonstrates that the local planning authorities in Wales are able to deal with the routine applications, but once a major application is submitted, then we, they don't have sufficient number of planners, they don't have the capacity in the bodies to deal with the major ones. So no, it's exceptionally important that we have a planning structure that is able to deliver very swiftly and also considers in detail what leadership is given from Welsh Government. First Minister, um, you've told me repeatedly in this chamber that the primary purpose of enterprise zones is to create new private sector jobs. Um, however, the KPIs published by your government actually um, suggest that you will publish an aggregate of jobs created, jobs safeguarded and jobs assisted and do not specify that they are private sector jobs that we are talking about. Is it still your intention that enterprise zones are there to create private sector jobs? They are, of course they are, and this is why, uh, of course, we have chosen not just those areas that are easier than others to pull in investment, Deeside being one such area, but we've also, of course, looked at areas such as Snowdonia, which historically have been difficult to attract investment into. We don't uh, try and look at the, uh, the easier areas. We want to make sure that, in, that uh, enterprise zones are spread out across uh, the whole of Wales, and enterprise zones are there to do exactly what it says in the tin, namely to promote enterprise. Question nine, Lynn Eagle. Minister provide an update on proposals to host the Commonwealth Games in Wales? Well, since December of 2012, we have been working with Cardiff, with Sport Wales and the Commonwealth Games Council on preliminary investigations to establish whether a bid should be mounted and what the implications would be. Thank you, First Minister. I believe that hosting the Games in 2026 could be a huge boost for the country, putting Wales at the centre of world attention for the duration of the Games and also underlining our growing reputation for organising and hosting global sporting events. First Minister, what is your assessment of the economic benefits the Games would bring to Wales and the sporting legacy it would leave? And will you ensure that hardwired into any bid is a commitment to ensure that places like Torvine fully share in the benefits of this particular potentially fantastic showcase for Wales. Well, we are undertaking an analysis of the benefits and costs. Uh, part of that will be informed by the experience we see in Glasgow uh, later on this year. I have to say that it, it's a very expensive uh, undertaking. There's no question about that. It's, it is uh, the, 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 the figures we are talking about run into the hundreds of millions of pounds uh, and a rigorous analysis of any benefits would have to be undertaken, even if, of course, the funds could be secured to host the Games. Those are the challenges that we face. The aspiration is still there, but much work needs to be done. Mohammed Asghar. Presiding officer. First Minister, the Commonwealth Games have the potential of projecting, pro projecting Cardiff on a global scale and of bringing real jobs and investment to the, this city and to the Wales also. Will the First Minister confirm his support for the bid and will he advise how many meetings his government major event unit has had with the officials of Cardiff City Council and other bodies with the aim of bringing the Commonwealth Games to Wales in 2026? There, there have been many meetings. I've had many meetings over this issue as well. Uh, the issue will be further informed following uh, an analysis of Glasgow. But as I say, the aspiration remains to look to host the Commonwealth Games, but it is an exceptionally expensive undertaking. There would have to be very clear and demonstrable benefits to Cardiff and the surrounding, well, not just the surrounding area, the whole of Wales, actually. So it would be a Commonwealth Games for the whole of Wales uh, before even considering uh, the next step of understanding where the money might come from, which again is not an easy question to answer. Beth and Jenkins. First Minister, of course, I would welcome any bid, particularly if there were an opportunity to uh, contest in the, our own colours as a nation, but I agree with what Lynn Neagle, Neagle had to say in terms of the legacy of the Games, because we have seen with the Olympic Games that we haven't actually benefited a great deal from the legacy of the Olympic Games that took place in England. So we do need to realize what 
Wales could act, how Wales could actually benefit, particularly as local councils are closing sports facilities or privatising them. The government must ensure that we, as Assembly member, members, fully understand how the people of Wales and young people of Wales will benefit from any games coming to this country. Well, that's right, and that, of course, is uh, why we're considering what the benefits and what the costs will be. So that by, I would say, by the autumn of this year, we'll be in a position to consider the challenges and the benefits. Thank you, First Minister. Um, I have agreed two urgent questions. And uh, first urgent question I ask Janet Finch Saunders if she'd like to ask the question that she admitted. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, will you make a statement on the implications for local authorities and public service providers in Wales of the recommendations proposed by the Commission on Public Service, Governance and Delivery? I refer the member to the answers I gave uh, in relation to question one. First Minister, ahead of the publication of this report and following many preemptive statements by yourself, there are predictions now of some 15,000 frontline staff that are now in limbo, waiting for news on what reorganisation will mean for them. Furthermore, the estimated costs of reorganisation have been somewhat wide-ranging, from 500 million by senior figures in the Welsh Labour, to 200 million from the Welsh Local Government Association, to 100 million by the Commission itself. This is a staggering gulf in estimates, First Minister. Now, I know the report uh, are you was coming only to a question? released yesterday. Immediately, please. What considerations have order, you given... Order, order. Carry on. First Minister, what considerations have you given to showing strong leadership by undertaking a full cost-benefit analysis in order to obtain a definitive cost to the taxpayers of reorganisation and to alleviate the concerns of our frontline staff? I accept the costings in the Williams Commission of £100 million. I see no need to conduct a, another exercise in terms of a cost-benefit analysis. I do intend that this should move forward as quickly as possible. I urge all those in this chamber, to con the leaders, to consult their parties. I look forward, of course, to looking to gain as much cross-party support as possible. I will not, as her leader said in his press conference this morning, uh, be in a position where the ball is in my lap and I should not therefore sit on it. I'm not a gymnast. I intend to... Uh, <laughs> I intend to take this forward as quickly as possible and I look forward to the views of other parties. Roger Glyn Thomas. <laughs> sorry, you've, um, sorry, you've had your question. Roger Glyn Thomas. First Minister, I'm very pleased to hear you say that you are going to respond positively and swiftly to the Williams Commission because if that doesn't happen, councils will be looking to see what partnerships they can form in considering the options that have been proposed by Williams. We need a firm and definite leadership on this. Are you confident that you can work to the timetable that the Williams Commission has set for you? Yes, I'd want to be in a position by Easter where in terms of my own party that we have a firm position in terms of other parties. I very much hope that the other parties could also express their views. I'm not saying that everyone would have the same views, but it is very important that this is progressed now. It's important that we bear in mind in terms of the Williams Commission that there were not representatives, but members of each party on the Commission. I understand that they weren't party nominees, but it was a broad-ranging Commission in terms of its membership, and it's now important that parties consider their own stance on the Commission itself so that we can progress with this issue. Black. Thank you, uh, Can I first of all confirm, First Minister, there was no member of the Welsh Liberal Democrats on that Commission? And secondly, can I ask you, in relation to, to the Commission, in relation to the, um, to the Commission report, um, you've indicated already that you wish to, um, to cons consult with the other parties and get a consensus as soon as possible. Can I ask you what plans you have to, to achieve a consensus among stakeholders and other people around the country? How will the consultation process on taking this forward um, um, pan out? Yes. First of all, I hadn't realised that the, the, the Liberal Democrats had resigned. On the, on the Commission, but it, it, it was a white Commission, whatever happens. In terms of consultation, the first step uh, is, to, to my mind, is for the party leaders to, to talk about this over the next few weeks, to look to uh, get to an established position by, by Easter. 
then of course there would need to be some debate as to what process this should be taken through. Whether it should be taken through the established legislative process, which means this wouldn't happen before the assembly elections, or whether there is a feeling in the chamber, and this is not something government should push, uh, to my mind, without acceptance elsewhere, that this should be taken through a, uh, a speedier process, with of course the permission of the presiding officer. Uh, that much is, is important. Th those are matters yet to be dealt with. Then, of course, at the appropriate time, a bill would be introduced. There would be consultation on the white paper, consultation on the draft bill itself. That would then give the opportunity for stakeholders to comment on uh, the principle and then the detail of any, uh, well, not just the reorganisation of local government, or the merger, I think is a better word, but on all the proposals included in Williams. Angela Burns. Um, First Minister, the report is silent on democratic accountability and you've just talked about producing white papers. Will you also be producing a white paper on how we will be able to elect people to whatever the new, uh, the new councils will be? For example, if Dovid came back, that would be 176 councillors, which is obviously unworkable. And also, what impact will this be having, First Minister, on the current legislative programme, which has got an awful lot of work on boundary orientated um, um, uh, organisations such as the six safeguarding boards in the social services bill and what work are you doing to see how this might um, how this might impact on the legislative programme? Well, we're confident this can be dealt with in the legislative programme should it be the will of the assembly that it should happen this side of the election. Uh, the Boundary Commission have indicated that they will, would be able to to complete any work on new boundaries by 2016 uh, which is, is ambitious, but clearly something that they, they have, I understand, indicated to us. Uh, initially, uh, there was a debate as to whether you keep the same number of councillors and then reduce them at the election following, but that obviously introduces a new option as far as uh, we're concerned. I don't think the report was silent about accountability. It was, it was far from silent about scrutiny. It did talk about uh, the, the lack of scrutiny that exists in many levels uh, of government, uh, and indeed in some bodies. It was particularly, I think scathing is the right word, uh, in terms of the attitude of some public service delivery bodies to regard inspection almost as an impertinence and not something to be used to improve uh, services. It talks a great deal about the need to improve scrutiny, particularly in authorities where it is suggested that officers have been running them with little scrutiny from, from members. And it talks, of course, about the need for a leadership academy and further training with regard to scrutiny. That much is, is important. Uh, if we look to uh, reorganise the way public services are delivered, uh, if there is a, an appetite to merge councils, as I believe that there, there is, uh, then of course, of course those issues mentioned in the Commission about scrutiny will be equally as important. Thank you, First Minister.